with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. I'm talking today from the subject of fishing when nothing's biting. Fishing when nothing's biting. Everybody goes through a season in their life where you're doing all of the right things. You, you've tried everything that you know to do in order to get the right results and you're fishing but nothing's biting. And then you wonder what, is, what in the world is going on here. You see, we all go through changes in life. Change is actually the only constant. God is the only one who does not change. The Bible says in the Old Testament, God says, I am the Lord, I change not. Uh, he does change his methods, but his essence does not change. And here's the second thing that I want you to note is that principles of truth don't change. Principles of truth don't change. So whenever you're going through changes where everything in your world is in flux and the world around you is changing, then you have to find an anchor in God. Find an anchor in God. Find your anchor in God. Find your anchor in God. Secondly, look for a relevant principle of truth. Look for a relevant principle of truth. You see, most of us feel that our very way of life is threatened. Whenever you face any kind of major change, especially when that major change is in one of the areas of what we call the big three. The big three is relationship. Secondly, health. And thirdly, money. Relationship, if you find a change in your relationship, or in your health, or in money, and the tricky part of that is that oftentimes all three of those areas are connected. Because let's say you have an accident that impairs your health. Now you can't go to work and now it's messing with your money. And if your money gets jacked up, it's going to put pressure on your relationship. Because you know that romance without finance is a nuisance. <laughs> and all of the women said, You see, if one of these areas in your life is changing, it can be very challenging. Now this is the time that I want you to realize that it's when you are experiencing uh, something that is dealing with collapse in your life or calamity or catastrophe in your life, it's when these things are, are happening that I want you to realize that these are the outward effects of a single cause called change where something is no longer the way that it was before. And so when you're going through, it's very difficult to identify what's happening to you as change. Because when you're in the middle of it, when everything is falling apart in your life, you don't see it as change. It feels more like the end than it feels like change. Where everything that you know is coming to an end and then that it seems like there's nothing afterward. You feel like your life is over, that it is ruined, that it is finished. You go through some situations where the devastation of some relationships is so traumatic in your life that you feel like it is the end. And I want you to know that whenever you go through these, it is simply a sign of a change, not the end. And so you never put a period where God only put a comma. You take your time and realize God has something in store. And he might be changing you, but it is not the end. But when you're going through, you feel like you're dying. You don't feel like you'll live through this. Some people can walk out of your life. You can lose the standard of your living and, and almost become suicidal because you interpret that thing as the end and you don't see it as a change that I'm going through. When you realize I am going through change, it means that I am going to come out on the other side. I, I'm never in trouble. I'm only going through trouble. When I say it that way, it is a, an indication of my faith that I already believe that this is not going to last forever. Even the longest day has an end. And I'm only going through this for a season. I'm going to get through it. It feels like it's the end. It feels like my life is over now. It is not the end. Touch your neighbor, say it's not the end. Not the end. When everything changes, listen to me carefully, when everything changes, when everything seems to change in your life, now stop and change everything. That's a thought. When everything changes, stop and change everything. 
stop and change everything. It is a fool to keep on doing uh, the same old thing and expecting a different result every time. That's foolishness, to be doing the same old thing. Wouldn't it have been stupid of Elijah the prophet to continue to stay there and wait for ravens to bring him bread in the morning and flesh in the morning and then bread and flesh in the evening after the brook had dried up, just sitting there waiting for the, uh, some water to mysteriously come up out of the ground? That would have been foolish. He realized this is not the end. This is a time for change. And when life and comfort as you know it changes, or ends, it is God's way of saying that, listen, every time that you're in something and there's an end to one relationship, there's an end to one job, it means here's a doorway to another one. It means that God is saying, I'm getting ready to do something different in your life. I'm going to change what you've been experiencing. I am going to change it. If you've been through a drought where you have been fishing all night long and nothing is biting, you've been trying to say, save and said, Lord, you know what? I'm trying to do this thing right. And the devil will come to you with all kinds of thinking and first make you start blaming God and then he'll make you start blaming the principles as if to say it does not pay to do right because I've been doing right and I'm still struggling. Anybody ever been there to feel like I've been trying to do what I know to do? I've been trying to give my tithes. I've been trying to pray and to read my Bible, and I'm still having a hard time. I still don't have the kind of employment that I feel like I deserve. And it'll make you think that something is wrong with the process and that something is wrong with you and that you need to change it. And I'm just here to tell you that some of this is a manifestation of sin in our lives. Because the church, the church, I'm not even talking about the world, the church has developed too much of a carelessness in our attitude towards sin. Sin still stinks in the nostrils of the living God. God is fed up. He's offended by sin. And the church who's become callous with sin because we've seen other people uh, do things that are wrong. Are you listening? And it seems as though they got away with it and like they're being blessed and they cheated and they lied and they're getting away with it and we're over here trying to do this thing legitimately and trying to be pleasing to God and we're struggling and having a hard time and they are big balling. May I remind you here of the word of the Lord. When it looks like those that are tares in the world are growing up and prospering, that the wheat and the tare grow up together. And so when God is blessing you and it looks like he's also blessing them, the wheat looks just like the tear, but the tear is hollow on the inside. They don't have anything on the inside. We've got something so strong on the inside. You are not what you look like. They don't have the heaviness of the weight of God's glory. And so when the wind comes, it will blow them down. When the stock market crashes, they commit suicide. But there's something so strong on the inside of us. When somebody walks out of their life, they want to commit murder. But when somebody walks out of yours, it drives us to our knees so that we begin to depend upon him and to trust upon him and to call on his name. And they that wait upon the Lord shall renew new their strength and they'll mount up with wings like eagles we don't ever give up you might look like the same but I declare to you that if we don't deal with our attitude of callousness towards sin it will lead us to calamity and when you deal with the calamity and experience calamity in your life then God will bring you to a place of closure when you come to closure, then you realize I am never going back to the vomit that God delivered me out of. There are too many of you that have gotten involved in sin, but you've never had closure. And you keep going back to the same old vomit, the same old stuff, falling for the same old lies. I don't know who I'm talking here today, but you've been flirting around with sin. Your attitude has become callous and you're callous in it, but it will lead you to a road called destruction. I'm only telling this not because I'm angry with you, but because I love you. And I want you to know that sin, any way you define it, any way you dress it up, even if they legalize sin, it is still sin. Call it something else, but it still stinks to God. And God is looking for people that will have a standard of righteousness and character and integrity in their hearts who even if they lose everything will refuse to curse God but will trust him in the midst of it all and you'll come that after you fished all night long and then the devil has mocked you and said well if you're righteous then why is it that you are not enjoying the blessing and these other folks here are and he'll show you people who appear to prosper 
and here you're struggling, wondering, God, where are you? Here I am in my boat trying to do things legitimately, and I'm out here suffering. I'm suffering. I'm fishing. I'm trying to do what I know to do, but nothing is biting. I need help, God. And you come to that place, and you're wondering, God, what do I do? Where do I go? What's my next step? I want you to realize when you feel like the end, like you're not going to make it through the night, it's not the end. All is well in the end. And if all is not well, it's not the end. Whatever you do, don't stop. Just change. Don't stop. Just change. You have to sometimes change your words. You have to sometimes change your perspective. You have to sometimes change your attitude, change your mindset. Sometimes you have to change your environment. Sometimes you have to change your partners. Sometimes you simply have to change your pace because you expected it to happen too fast and you were running life like you had to get it done overnight. Life is not a sprint. You run full speed with a sprint. You don't run full speed with a marathon. God's trying to give you a lifestyle. You can't run a lifestyle full speed, blasted wide open with everything that you've got. You'll run out and burn out too quickly. You have to pace yourself for the journey. I've been on the journey long enough to know you can't run full speed. I started out full speed until I found myself sitting on the curb hyperventilating. And I realized that I had to be able to create a pace, a cadence in life that I can maintain. Taking my time, I had to run. I'm running a marathon, a marathon that has hurdles and curves. And you got to be able to make sure that you have the right partners with you. Sometimes you got to change your partners. I used to ride a motorcycle, and every now and then I'd have somebody on the back, and I'd go into a curve. And I had to have somebody who could lean with me in the curve. I didn't want to go in the curve, and I'm leaning this way, and then they're trying to go that way because we're getting ready to have an accident because I've got somebody that does not know how to handle the curves. And most people in life wipe out in the curve. It is when things are not going the way that they are, have been going and things are turning here, they wipe out in the curve. And I need somebody more than at any other time to be able to lean with me in the curve. Lean with it. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't stop. Just lean with it, rock with it, but don't stop. And I declare to you, that when you are busy rowing the boat, you don't have time to rock it. <laughs> row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, merrily. You know it. How do you turn a football team around that's on a losing streak? You change the head coach, the game plan, the strategy. Sometimes a few of the key players, you change their image, their mindset, the way they view themselves, their attitude, you change their habits. Winning is a habit. It's a habit. Change their habits. You notice here in Luke chapter 5 and verse 2, they saw two boats standing by the lake. Standing by the lake. Standing boats don't make any money. You have a few folk just standing around, they don't make any money. They were standing by the lake. The provisions were in the lake, and they were standing by the place of blessing. Sometimes you are so close when you think you are so far. Standing by it, standing right on the brink of the greatest blessing in their life, they were standing by it and couldn't smell it. Standing by it and couldn't see it. Standing by it, idly standing by it, washing their nets. Their nets. Say nets. You see, what you make at work is called gross money. What you bring home is net, net income. And when you're washing your nets, empty nets, mind you, they were empty, because by the time you bring your net home and you pay the phone company and the power company and the mortgage and the car note and the insurance, 
What started off as gross is now really net, and you're washing empty nets because it's all owed out. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Uh, one man told me, he said, I'm prayed weekly, very weekly. <laughs> washing their net. There's a scripture in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 4. It says, where no oxen are, the manger is clean, but much revenue comes by the strength of the ox. Now here's the Bronner interpretation. An empty barn stays clean, but it makes no money. It's nice to keep a clean place, but your goal in business is not to just have a clean place, it's to make money. And here they were standing by the place of great blessing and provision and couldn't see the opportunity that was before them. And if you can't see the opportunity, you cannot seize it. And you've made an assumption that there are no fish in the lake just because none of them are biting when you go fishing. And it was a wrong assumption. Notice here in verse 3, then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat out and taught the multitudes from the boat. You see, something changed the moment that Jesus got into the boat. There was a leadership change immediately. Now the captain of the ship, a new captain comes in, and they gave him a platform from which to teach. And remember, you need an anchor in God, and you need a relevant principle of truth. You need an anchor in God, and you need a a relevant principle of truth. And notice, notice verse 4 here. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Let down your nets for a catch. Let me tell you this. Jesus' idea of what he wants to do in your life is bigger than what we can conceive. Jesus said to him, let down your nets. Now, I want you to notice, notice what he said in verse 5. At the end of it, he said, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net, singular. Jesus told him, let down your nets, plural, because I'm going to do something exceeding abundantly above what you can ask or think. He says, you're going to need more than one network. Are you listening? He said, let down your nets. Let down your nets. You need multiple streams of income. Let down your nets. Let down your nets. He, he was so small in his thinking that he couldn't even hear the S on it. He couldn't even hear the plurality. He was one in, the, in, in one of those mindsets where, God, if you just feel one net, I'll be satisfied. If you just give me one good week, I'll be satisfied. Just let me close one good deal, and I'll be satisfied. No, no, no. He said, let down your nets. And then he misunderstood him. He said, nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net, singular. When your vision is too small, you don't hear things as they are you hear things as you are so because he was small he could not hear the plurality of the multiplied mindset that God was trying to talk to him about that a network is for multiplication otherwise he would have told him to go fishing with a fishing pole and with a fishing pole you only catch one at a time but with a net you can catch so many that you can't count them. And this is where he was in this position. When he told them to launch out, he was telling them, get out on a limb. You know why he told them to get out on a limb? Because that's where the fruit grows. Launch out. Don't just stay in the shallow. Don't stay up on the, on the short. Launch out into the deep. Go where the fish are. I've had some individuals that started a church and I saw them put a sign up front saying, sinners, welcome here. I went over to one pastor and I just put my arms around his shoulders. I said, you see your sign here? I said, that is about as effective as a fisherman putting a sign on the side of his boat saying, fish, welcome here. I said, you have to launch out. You have to launch out. They may not just come to you, you launch out to them. Launch out. Get out on the limb. Go to where the fruit is. Go to where they hang out. Go to where they fellowship. Go to where they work. Go to where they live. He, he was saying to them, in other words, get into position. There's something that God cannot do until you get into position. You're asking them to do something, and you're saying, you know, God, come on, give me the birth, and you're not in position yet. 
You see, a woman can't start pushing even though she's in labor and having pain. She can't start pushing just because she starts hurting. She has to start pushing because she's gotten into position, because uh, she has fully dilated and she is 100% effaced. Then it's time to push. If you push otherwise, you will cause the cervix to swell and you'll impede the process and then you'll end up having to have a cesarean. So you cannot get the blessing of a birthing that comes from God until you first get into position. That's all he was saying, launch out, get into position. When he says get into position, he's saying retool yourself, retool yourself. You retool yourself by reschooling yourself because we cannot fight today's war with yesterday's weapons. Retool yourself, retool yourself, make yourself relevant. And, and, and understand this, when he says launch out into the deep, it is God's way of saying that I want you to participate in the miracle. He could have made the fish just leap right into the boat, but he didn't because he said, I want you to participate in this miracle. I want to work with you. The Bible talks about how when the disciples went out, it says the Lord working with them, confirming his word with signs following. God was working with them. Did you know God wants to work with you? Look at verse 6. And when they had done this, when they had obeyed, they obeyed. They caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. They didn't do anything but let down their nets. They became obedient. It's what they became. And here, here's this principle. Listen to me carefully. You never have to pursue what you can attract. You never have to pursue what you can attract. You're looking at a preacher. I've never sent anybody a flyer to tell them, invite me to come and preach. And I have more engagements that I turn down because I just, I'm one, one person and I can't take them all. Because you, I don't have to pursue what I can attract. Are you listening? If you become something, you can attract it to you. Are you listening? Without your having to pursue it. Through their obedience, they didn't have to pursue the fish. They just had to let down the net and they were attracted to the net. May I just tell you that when you come into obedience with God and go at his word, you don't even have to pursue it. What you can attract, just become attractive. And you can attract people because of the positiveness of Jesus' spirit. He attracted people to it. Everywhere he went, multitudes came out. He didn't go after people looking after them. They start coming. The multitudes followed him because he had something in him. He put worth and value in himself. You'll attract people to you. I never had to push my way and finagle my way and ask this and do that. I simply asked God, God, make me a blessing. That's the only prayer that I've ever prayed concerning myself. God, make me a blessing. I never prayed God bless me. And, and it's all right if you pray God bless me. I, I'm not trying to say that there's anything wrong with that. It's, if you need to be blessed, ask him to bless you. But what I realized that if I ask God to make me a blessing, that he had to bless me so that I could bless others. And so I just prayed the prayer, God, make me a blessing make me a blessing and guess what people who needed the blessing that was in me began to be attracted to me because God was like I, I know what answers I have put in this person and so guess what I attracted people to me that had the questions that I had the answer to and it was God's spirit it was a miracle of his spirit that began to doing the attraction and so you never have to pursue what you can attract if people realize that there's healing in your life, sick people will be attracted to you. If there is joy in your life, sad, depressed people will be attracted to you. If lonely people are in your life and you're gregarious, then lonely people will be attracted to you. You'll be surprised how you can attract better than what you can pursue by what you become. And I just want you to see that there is a process in God that when the fish are not biting. Let me give you these six things quickly. When nothing is biting, number one, pray, pray. Pray like it's going out of style. Pray, 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 pray. Pray, pray, pray. Pray like it's all left up to God and then work like it's all left up to you. Pray. Number two, learn. Learn everything you can. Reposition yourself. Retool yourself with relevant tools. Retool yourself. Learn, 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 learn. Number three, think. 
you got to learn something before you start thinking because the learning will broaden your thinking. You cannot think beyond your exposure. So you have to learn something before you start the thinking. And then as a man thinketh, so is he. You want to change your life, change your thinking. Number four, dream, 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 dream a new dream. I mean, if there was something that you could do and you realize that you could not fail at doing it, what would it look like? Start dreaming. When was the last time that you believed God honestly for something that seemed impossible to you? When was the last time you had a dream? And you can tell a God-given dream because it'll cost more than what you can afford. It'll need more people than what you have the resources for. When was the last time that you really dreamed a God dream? And God changes the world by people who have a dream that looks like it's crazy because it has you going out at a time when you have nothing yourself and God says you might go out empty but you're not going to come back the same way. You let down your net at my word and you will take in a catch. Number four, plan, plan, plan because if God blesses you and if you don't have a plan, I can't tell you how many dreams have committed suicide through a lack of preparation. They're rarely killed by the devil. They commit suicide through a lack of preparation. Plan, plan, plan. You have to make a plan. The vision, dreams have to be organized and there has to be a plan. You have to know who's going to do what by when. You have to have a plan for it. Number six, do it, execute it. If there were five birds sitting on a tree limb and one decides to fly away, how many are still left? All five of them. One only decided to fly, he didn't fly. <laughs> and you'll be surprised at people that dream and they plan and they dream and they plan and they dream and they plan and they never jump and they never launch and they never execute and they never do and God can only bless what you are willing to do. He can only bless what you're willing to do. He can only bless what you're willing to do. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time, God bless you.